Good day and welcome everybody. My name is Sarah Charters and I'm here uh, today with you in my role as the president of the United Church of Canada's foundation. And I'm so pleased to be able to collaborate with Cher to bring this conversation to United Church investors from coast to coast to coast. I myself am located in the east end of Toronto, just about a kilometer from Lake Ontario, on land that's the traditional home of the Haudenosaunee Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabewaki, and uh, that is part of the Williams Treaty from uh, 1923. My commitment is to not just name the peoples who have lived, played, worked, traded, taken care of this land and continue to do so to this day, uh, but to learn about the treaties and to share the knowledge with my family and my friends, my community. And through doing that, I hope to better understand the current context and be able to find paths towards right relations and reconciliation. Um, and so today we are here as institutional or organizational investors to talk about how we can and are um, addressing Indigenous rights issues and advancing reconciliation in our investments. Um, as you are well aware, we are using Zoom and it's in its webinar format. So the panelists will all be able to uh, speak, but the rest of us are gonna be automatically muted. And so as we go along, if you have questions, there's two ways to raise those. There is a Q&A um, option that you can just click on and type your question in there. And there's always the chat um, as well. We'll be looking at both of those to uh, bring those forward um, once uh, once our panelists have um, spoken. Um, and um, so I guess the the thing to to say next is that um, why um, the foundation is collaborating with Share today is because the United Church has made a series of commitments to reconciliation. And as a United Church investor, investing body, the foundation is actively seeking ways to incorporate United Church values into its investments, which includes um, reconciliation. We also work to support other United Church organizations in their own investments, be it through investing with the foundation or one of our affiliates, providing opportunities like this for conversation about topics of importance for, for today and for the future. And so while the foundation's focus is firmly on the future, creating, maintaining, rejuvenating communities of faith with sustainable um, assets and funding, what we do now in the present impacts our ability to support that vision of a future where the church is living into deep spirituality, bold discipleship, and daring justice. So it's crucial that we address issues like reconciliation in all facets of our work, and I appreciate you making the time and space for this conversation today. I'm very grateful to be joined by a number of folks, including Kit Lowen, a member of the United the Pension Board of the United Church of Canada's Pension Plan and a member of the General Council Executive. Simon Lucic, who is the Manager of Corporate Engagement and Advocacy for SHARE, along with his colleagues, Joseph Bastien, Bastien, my apologies, Project Manager for Reconciliation Responsible Investment Initiative, and Sarah coutrier tano Manager of Corporate Engagement at SHARE. So our four speakers are gonna offer us uh, their wisdom and expertise and experience, and then we'll have some time for um, discussion. So I will turn the microphone now over to Kit for her opening remarks. Thank you, Sarah. And thank you to everyone who's participating in this event today. This is really uh, an important conversation. Um, my hope today, uh, speaking to you from Saskatoon, um, my, my residence is, is uh, on Treaty 6 territory and uh, specifically also on the Round uh, Prairie Settlement uh, territory of the Métis people. Um, I'm, my hope is to provide a very, very uh, high level kind of overview of, of how I as a member of the pension board have understood our journey uh, to the integration of commitments to reconciliation in, in our work um, 
uh, with the fund. And so to do that, what I'd like to do is to present to you uh, two metaphors, one as bookends, I guess, one uh, to begin my uh, thoughts and one to conclude them. So to begin, the first metaphor that I'd like to present to you is that of a very large, heart, hearty uh, and hardy tree. Um, the, the image of a tree that you can conjure will, will uh, I'll reflect on the roots of the tree, the trunk of the tree, and the big boughs or the branches. As a, as a pension plan, and I would uh, presume to say as investors within the United Church of Canada, whether it's in one of the, the, the three main funds of the United Church, or if it's in the, the fund that you're um, interested in at a, at a community of faith level or in some other level. Um, I think the, the, the roots of the tree that really uh, inform, must inform the work that we do with our investments are, are focused primarily on three main uh, root tracks, if you will. One would be uh, obviously, the uh, United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. And in, there are specific articles within uh, UNDRP that I think are, are really uh, critical to our understanding of the foundation of how we would proceed. And the second uh, seems obvious to uh, the, um, the TRC, and then particularly the the Within the Truth and Reconciliation Final Report, there are 10 principles um, relating to reconciliation that I think are very important and, and really worth your study and consideration. And the third main root track um, in, in my th thinking would be the caretaker calls to the church within the United Church of Canada. And and specifically within those calls, I'd like to read a couple of the um, comments that are made in the calls to the church that, that speak to the earth as our provider. And here I quote from, from page three, if you're interested to, to look back. The caretakers have said to us that the earth is our provider. It is our ground of being. The earth is our mother. The earth is our sustenance and the earth is our Eden. And they go on in that section to say that uh, obviously indigenous people have been forcibly separated from their lands, um, that the land has been stolen from us and now others eat from its provisions. So I, I think about those three main root tracks, UNDRP, the, the TRC principles of reconciliation and the caretaker calls to the church as being fundamentally important and foundational in informing how we proceed. You might find, uh, for example, the final report on the, the, um, the final report on the, uh, the study of missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls to be also really important. And at the local level, you might find other um, sources that are foundational to the work that you do. Moving from the root tracks to the trunk of the tree, my mind goes to the commitments made by the United Church of Canada that Sarah has already referenced, specifically the, the three calls of, of bold discipleship, daring justice, and uh, deep spirituality. As well, um, the United Church of Canada, the, the three main uh, funds of the United Church of Canada, the Foundation, the Treasury Fund, and the Pension Fund have common principles of commitment that, um, that are really, really uh, important to our approach to responsible investment. And specifically, they state that responsible investment is a positive force that can uh, change corporate behavior as well as changing the landscape of, of the investment world generally. That responsible investment is more than negative screening. It's more than eliminating the, the, the uh, tobacco, the, the armaments, the alcohol, whatever the negative screening might be. Critically important, uh, those principles include a statement that engagement is a, a powerful force to change corporate behavior. And finally, the understanding that uh, a responsible investment approach 
can simultaneously honor the values of the United Church of Canada, as well as generating the funds that are necessary for the work of, of uh, the work that you are doing in whatever area. And so we think for a time such as this, in which we find ourselves, where some would say that we're no longer in a climate crisis, but we're in a climate emergency, that there really is no passive response that is appropriate, that an active response is, is critical. So that's how I think about the trunk of the tree. And I think about how they inform those principles then inform the not only the three major funds of the United Church of Canada, but also the fund that you might be interested in as you participate in this in this event today, um, that might be a smaller, uh, more local fund. So now what I'd like to do very briefly is turn to the second metaphor that I have in my mind, and that is of a sonnet. Um, and I think of a sonnet as having a very rigid, um, detailed structure, but within that rigid structure, there are some beautiful expressions that can be both powerful and hopeful that can, can find its way within that structure. And so I think about, and particularly in the pension fund where <laughs> the regulatory environment is so, um, uh, feels a very uh, rigid. I still, I, I believe that within that structure, much like within the, uh, the literary um, sonnet, we can still find ways, beautiful ways to express our commitments to discipleship, to justice, to spirituality, both within the, the external structures that are imposed on us, but also within the internal structures that guide us. And so it's my wish that you today find ways to be hopeful, to find that um, spirit of discipleship, which I, I'm always reminded comes from the, the root word of learning. This is, it's an opportunity for us to, to be learning and also our commitment to justice. So thank you to Sarah and to the others for this opportunity to allow me to speak my mind on this. Thank you, Kit. Really appreciate your, your time and your, the metaphors are really quite powerful that you've offered. Um, and I'm just gonna ask Stephanie from SHARE to put that link in the chat. It's um, more information on the calls to the church in case people wanna have a look at that. Thank you. And I'll turn it over to you, Simon. Great, thanks, uh, Sarah. Thank you, Kit. Uh, my name is Simon Luchuk. I'm joining today from Ottawa, Ontario, uh, which is the traditional unceded land of the Algonquin and the Shenandoah people. Um, and it's great to be here and uh, to be joining such um, an active and, and keen group in this discussion. I'm just going to speak very quickly for about two minutes, um, just to give you a little bit of context about who Share is, um, and that'll help situate some of the. Uh, uh, the content that my colleagues Joseph and, and Sarah will be speaking to uh, in a more fulsome um, sense. But um, Shares a, a nonprofit. We're based here in Canada, and we mobilize investor leadership for a sustainable, inclusive, and productive economy. Um, and we really do uh, believe in doing that in collaboration and uh, with others. Um, and so we support a diverse network of institutional investors. Um, everything from uh, mid-sized pension funds to uh, a network of Canadian universities, foundations, uh, indigenous trusts, and, and a, a core part of our, um, our, our network and our identity, in fact, is uh, religious investors as well. And so uh, I have no doubt that some of you on the call today are well familiar with that, uh, with that history and with um, some of Share's uh, origin story. And sorry, Share stands for the Shareholder Association for Research and Education. Um, but you know, the, the roots of our work go back to uh, you know, the mid 1970s and into the 80s with the work of uh, the task force uh, for church and corporate responsibility. And again, names that you would recognize like Moira Hutchinson and Bill Davis and, and others, my colleague Peter, who's on the call, who really played an instrumental role in um, uh, originally focusing on the you know, corporate involvement with uh, apartheid in South Africa um, to bring, um, to, to connect 
uh, the, the values of people of faith um, with uh, investments and with the impacts, uh, the social environmental uh, impacts that companies are having in the real economy. And so our religious investor network today has um, grown out of that and, and continues to be part of our um, our, our identity as an organization, although we do, you know, we're, um, you know, we're not a faith-based organization. We work with a very diverse group of, of investors, but um, we do amongst our clients count a number of um, church affiliated um, pension funds, endowments, religious congregations, post-secondary uh, institutions, and, and so on. But again, what unites all of us um, and, and all of uh, Shares Networks um, is that values base and that long-term view of sustainable investing um, and believing that investment risk um, and faith imperatives for things like social and ecological justice um, are, you know, can be addressed in, in, in tandem. And so uh, share um, works with our, with our networks and our clients on issues such as reconciliation, which we'll be talking about, uh, poverty, human rights, and, uh, and, and climate and ecological justice. Um, so I'm going to leave it up to Sarah and Joseph to speak to what that looks like um, in, in context and in, in, in concrete ways. But again, thank you for having us. And um, I'll uh, pass it off uh, to them now. Thank you so much, Simon. Um, so my name is Sarah Kuchiyatano, and I am manager of corporate engagement at Share, and I um, particularly lead our engagement on decent work uh, and human rights. Uh, in the next thirty minutes or so, my colleague Joseph and myself will discuss how religious investors can use uh, good engagement strategies to improve companies' non-financial externalities and positively impact the society more broadly. And we will particularly focus on reconciliation and uh, provide illustration of what shareholder engagement is and looks like through this lens. So shareholder engagement is uh, an active ownership strategy that enables investors to influence companies from their investment portfolio. It allows shareholders to steward their assets in a way that would drive positive social and environmental outcomes. It is a very powerful tool that enables investors to use their voices as shareholders to support better corporate sustainability policies and practices. So through our uh, shareholder engagement program, we help a network of investors uh, like you to put your values into action to mitigate risk, enhance long-term shareholder value, and promote a sustainable, inclusive, and productive economy. Our engagement program includes direct discussions with companies, either one-on-one -on -one or working collaboratively, collaboratively sorry, uh, with other investors. And where appropriate, we file shareholder proposals to be voted on at companies' AGMs to help focus our discussions with companies and to bring increased investors' attention to certain issues. So there are a lot of responsible investment strategies out there and shareholder engagement is a very special one because it allows shareholders to use their shareholder power, their rights of control, to change corporate policies and action. And you would be amazed uh, to see how certain investors, no matter their size and asset values, have uh, impacted companies in a way um, that would um, make a true difference. So we like to see engagement and divestment as complementary um, strategies, as one allows you to stop financing. Um, oops, sorry, I have, I have, can you hear me? Yeah, can we can someone... hear you. Yes, you're good. Oh. Okay, I can hear you, but my screen is, is black, so I cannot see anything. I sincerely, I sincerely apologize. So um, I'll just uh, turn off my laptop and come back in really a minute. Maybe um, Joseph, do you want to um, to to jump in and speak a bit about our program on reconciliation? I'm not really sure uh, if I can hear anyone. Yeah, it's, so it's just that just... we can't hear you. Do you have a volume? Uh, Stephanie, is there something? Uh, Joseph, I think you're you're muted, Joe. Can you guys hear me now? Now we, we can. can. Yes. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. 
I, I swear at share, we're actually decent with technology. This is a, a one-off uh, little blip on our end. Um, so Ani Bojo, Wabna Niki, Dijna Kathu Kamakong, Dunjaba. My name is Joseph Bastine. I'm from Wikwimakong, uh, unceded territory up on the beautiful eastern shores of Manitoulin Island. Uh, I live with my family uh, just west of London in the shared territories of the Anishinaabek, the uh, Haudenosaunee, and the Lenin Lenape people. Beautiful little trifecta that we have going on in our community. It's nice to have that representation. Uh, I was going to start off uh, talking about how we kind of understand reconciliation and, you know, the role of share in the reconciliation space. But my colleague Simon actually hit a piece that's often overlooked. And that's the uh, history of reconciliation, understanding that colonization uh, was a global uh, effort. Um, and that the TRC efforts in Canada really were birthed out of the TRC efforts uh, in South Africa, which were a result of campaigns by activists and investors, not just in South Africa, but in Rhodesia and uh, now the Zimbabwe uh, and other countries that were former colonies. So when we think about where we are in reconciliation in Canada, the roots of the work that we do, uh, you know, going back to Moira Hutchinson and the work of Peter Chapman and others, uh, carries us from the South African TRC to the Canadian TRC. So to provide a bit of historical context, uh, when we think about reconciliation in Canada, there are a number of different ways we can view it. We can view it as the responsibility of the individual in ways of advancing uh, reconciliation. And really reconciliation is the uh, redress of historical wrongs. It's the dismantling of institutionalized racism, and it's the provision of equitable opportunities and outcomes uh, for Indigenous peoples who were traditionally really excluded from those. So it hits two different levels, one at, or three, really four, if we want to think about it, the individual, uh, the social, the governmental, and then kind of the institutional level. And the institutional level can be broken out often as being a responsibility of corporate Canada, but when we think about institutionalized racism, it's not just based in corporate Canada, we find it in education institutions, uh, we find it in healthcare, we find it in uh, all sorts of other uh, pillars of our society that, uh, you know, promoted and supported and perpetuated anti-Indigenous racism in Canada. Unfortunately, uh, that history does involve a lot of our faith-based groups. Uh, and, you know, I have to applaud the United Church for the leadership that they've really shown in the space uh, in advancing reconciliation and really making it a priority for their congregations and for the national organization. It has not gone unnoticed. So my role is really to speak about, uh, you know, the role of institutions in reconciliation and how it would apply uh, to uh, individual congregations or, you know, regional groups or, you know, the larger national organization here. So when we think about that, we think about those two categories of reconciliation. You can really think of, uh, you know, human rights and reconciliation and economic reconciliation as the two kind of general pillars of reconciliation and how we address it here. And there are three really foundational documents that, you know, if anybody was like, what's on your top three things that I should really read to understand reconciliation. Uh, the first would be the recommendations uh, and the principles that came out of the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People, which, uh, Kit, thank you for mentioning those. Uh, you know, I cannot stress enough that people, you know, read those. There are a number of recommendations that are in the UNDRIP that you go, I can't believe we need to actually say this, but we really do because Indigenous rights are still not protected and respected globally. So what we think of as the Canadian approach or, you know, the Canadian status of Indigenous rights doesn't apply in countries like Peru or Chile or in the Philippines. So there are still, you know, things that we would think would be natural that really need to be advocated for in the international realm. And one of the key principles that came out of UNDRIP was uh, free prior informed consent, commonly known as FPIC. So again, because this is going to be an acronym that you're going to hear a lot probably in the next 40 minutes, free prior informed consent, FPIC. And that's really that Indigenous peoples, Indigenous communities have the ability to, you know, deliberate, make a decision in their best interest and consent to projects or decisions or actions that may impact 
their indigenous rights, title or interest. Indigenous rights, you know, the rights that they have maintained as communities and as people since time immemorial. Uh, title, which you could look at both the occupied and traditional lands of indigenous people uh, upon where we all sit. You heard Sarah and Kit and Simon uh, and I acknowledge the people upon whose lands we, uh, you know, reside and where we live, work and play. And, you know, consenting being that they're, you know, unfettered and not made under duress that a community is able to balance the voices of their community and make a best in, a decision in their best interest. And that FPIC decision really carries into our next two documents as well. The first being the T second being the TRC. Again, Kit, thank you for bringing that up. And when we think about the role um, of institutions and the role of institutional investors, we really look to TRC call 92. And I'm just going to take a minute to read it to you. We call upon the corporate sector in Canada to adopt the United Nations Declaration of Rights of Indigenous People, also known as UNDRIP, if you hear us using that you know, acronym, as a reconciliation framework to apply its principles, norms, and standards to corporate policy and core operational activities involving Indigenous peoples and their lands and resources. This would include and not be limited to meaningful consultation, free prior informed consent, a little blurb there about that. Uh, ensuring Indigenous peoples have equitable access to jobs, training, education in the corporate sector, and that Aboriginal communities gain long-term sustainable benefits and economic development projects, and education within organizations uh, on Indigenous issues, specifically around UNDRIP, uh, Treaty and Aboriginal Rights, Indigenous Law, Aboriginal Crown uh, Relations, and the history of residential schools, which I know the United Church has taken steps to implement these recommendations to ensure that people are aware of them. So we see kind of the two pillars again. One, the FPIC human rights pillar that falls under UNDRIP. Two, this economic reconciliation piece uh, about equitable access to jobs, training, education opportunities, and long-term sustainable benefits. And those are two pieces that we're going to see throughout this thread. The third is a uh, relatively new document that uh, I've, you know, humbly was brought to my attention recently as in within the last six months. And as an Indigenous man uh, with five sisters uh, and a wonderful Indigenous matriarch in my family, um, the fact that I didn't know that there were recommendations in the sphere uh, was a humbling and teachable moment. And I bring that up because we're all learning. Right. So no matter where you are in the space, we're all learning more things. And it's a learning space for myself. It's a learning space for Simon and Sarah and, you know, our colleagues at the United Church. So, you know, we all approach this humbly and we all approach this with an open mind. And I'm specifically referring to the national inquiry into missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. And they put out a report with two sections, one on principles uh, for change and two on calls for justice that really apply well to institutions. There was a call to justice for all governments, uh, human and indigenous rights and government obligations for immediate implementation and you know, action on UNDRIP. Really, I feel like that applies to institutions broadly. And then a call for partnership around the extractive industry, which we found interesting at first, around uh, you know, safety and security of Indigenous women, girls, and LGBTQ2SIA people um, you know, around these spaces where there is a lot of natural resource development. And as we looked into this, we suddenly, you know, and I grew to understand the impact of, of man camps and other uh, you know, issues of violence that arise uh, around uh, extractive uh, properties and extractive projects that specifically really uh, impact those three groups, uh, Indigenous women, girls, and the LGBTQ2SQIA communities. And this is really where RRII um, steps in to kind of uh, affect change. So we are a joint venture between SHARE and NATOA, which is the National Aboriginal Trust Officers Association of Canada. 
And we really envision a financial system that empowers Indigenous perspectives and recognizes the role of Indigenous community values in investment decision making and contributing to protecting Indigenous rights and title. And we work with both institutional investors uh, in publicly traded markets and with Indigenous tr communities, Indigenous trusts, and Indigenous financial institutions like the First Nations Financial Management Board or the First Nations Bank. Now, our approach is really based on three pillars, um, allyship, awareness, and accountability. In terms of awareness, we you know, provide capacity development to Indigenous communities and Indigenous financial institutions. Uh, that includes direct support, like, you know, customized resources of developing options for community reviewing portfolios, uh, you know, looking at where they're invested. It could be curriculum development where we provide training for those communities with NATOA uh, to build that deep capacity within their community to, you know, shepherd their resources. In terms of uh, allyship, we work with a lot of Indigenous uh, or non-Indigenous uh, financial institutions. Uh, I like to call them allied institutions. Um, in terms of education and collaboration. So we do a lot of training. I do trainings like this with uh, pension funds and other investment groups. So uh, I, this is my favorite part of the job, working with interested parties to learn more about how they can be. Um... Well, I'm gonna share with you a, a new phrase that I've recently learned. Um, it's from Dr. Yaba Blay. Uh, talking about allyship. And one of the things that Dr. Blay said is we don't need allies, we need accomplices. We need people who are uh, with us looking to challenge, uh, you know, the institutional powers and those structures. So I would, uh, you know, invite you to become accomplices in advancing reconciliation, economic reconciliation in Canada. I don't know if I can put that in my presentations when I go to banks that I'm looking for accomplices. I'm not sure how that would land. So we'll just keep calling them allied investors for now. And we also look at accountability and advocacy. And a big part of that is, like Sarah said, our shareholder engagement. Um, you know, we look at engaging companies to advance uh, Indigenous rights issues and Indigenous economic reconciliation. We also work on Indigenous corporate disclosure. So having companies, uh, you know, disclose more publicly to and regularly on their Indigenous issues uh, in the public space so that investors can make informed decisions. We feel like these are material. Uh, this is material information for investors. Um, and we work on, you know, legal, regulatory and policy issues. We advise uh, the CSA, the Canadian Securities Administrators, the OSC, the Ontario Securities Administrators and others on ways that they can uh, work within those legal and regulatory frameworks to uh, advance reconciliation and protect Indigenous rights, especially as we look to, you know, Bill C-15 and Bill 252, which are going to be, you know, implementing the principles of UNDRIP in both federal and provincial legislation. It's not going to happen immediately, but within the next five and 10 years, we're going to have a very different legal and regulatory landscape that looks at ways that our laws and our policies and their application advance and promote Indigenous interests in Canada. So on that note, I'm going to stop at the engagement piece to hand it over to my colleague, Sarah, who's going to speak uh, more to the details of what our engagement looks like. And then I'll come back with some examples of our Indigenous engagements. Sarah. Thank you, Joseph, for Mr. Fully feeling for me. Um, so that's a very good segue. Uh, and I'll just continue talking uh, a bit more about what shareholder engagement looks like. Uh, so there are a lot of responsible investment strategies out there and shareholder engagement is, I think, a very special one because it allows investors to use their shareholder power um, to, uh, to change corporate policies and actions. And you would be amazed to see how certain investors, no matter their size and asset values, have impacted companies' behavior and its stakeholders. It, it really makes a difference. And we like to see engagement and divestment as complementary strategies, as one allows you to stop financing certain activities with too many negative externalities on people and the environment, while the other one allows you to actively promote positive outcomes from within. And one way to see that as complementary is that even with a strong divestment strategy, you cannot opt out from every 
companies with negative externalities. Most of them do either directly or from their supply chain um, have this kind of uh, adverse impact. And many investors made the choice to combine these two strategies and this way maximize their impact. That being said, um, engagement can be intimidating at first because it takes expertise, it takes specific knowledge uh, in all these issues like human rights, decent work, environmental issues, etc. And it also takes resources that some investors don't necessarily have. And this is also one reason why many small and medium investors choose to work with sharers. We provide a cost-effective way to use your voice collectively and drive systemic change without developing um, expertise in-house or burden existing staff with added responsibilities. Share has a long-standing experience in shareholder engagement, and in the past decades, we have been able to bring forward issues to companies management and board of directors um, and to the investment community as well. When we talk about sustainability issues, there are so many problems to tackle that it is simply impossible to take on every fight. So um, reconciliation, racial justice are one of our top engagement priorities. Um, we define our engagement priorities based on where we believe that shareholders, especially those that we represent, can have the most impact. And while we review those priorities on a yearly basis, they don't change much as uh, those issues are all very well entrenched in our society and economies. Our engagement program is built around three high-level teams. So there is decent work in human rights, um, investing in reconciliation, and climate transition for a sustainable economy. And each of these teams are broken down into focus areas in which we articulate a specific strategy, a vision, and a set of goals and reconciliation and racial justice are part of that. That being said, our program of reconciliation existed well before we initiated a comprehensive plan on racial justice. And while the two are very closely related, they are somehow different and my colleague Joseph talked about it. One of the shareholder engagement tools that we use sometimes besides uh, regular dialogue with companies or shareholder proposals. So it consists in submitting a matter to a shareholder vote at EGM when a dialogue has proven to be ineffective in aligning our concerns with the company's views. Shareholders' proposal have several benefits. Um, first, they usually facilitate a conversation with the company's board or management when progress or stagnating. Two, they elevate the conversation on a social issue to a broader audience and allow all shareholders of a company to share their views through their vote. Three, they are also a cost-effective way to educate investors on a particular issue that they may have overlooked. And while some of these proposals go to a vote, in the event we cannot reach a satisfactory agreement with the company, some are withdrawn and will never be voted on. And this happens when a company agrees that the issue raised in the proposal is material and agrees to act on it in a meaningful way. So I'll turn once more to my colleague Joseph to provide an example of engagement and reconciliation. And also, just I feel free to uh, to speak maybe a bit about how um, you defined uh, your strategy and your objectives on this matter. Thank you, Sarah. So that was a fantastic overview of um, the engagement process. And so, you know, the question becomes where, what can you do? To, it's very dark where I am. Um, let me, we're about to get a very bad rainstorm. Let me just turn on a light for one second. Hopefully that's better. Went from beautiful natural light to uh, rather ominous outside and I hope I don't lose my connection. So the question is, what can you do tomorrow? You've attended this session today, you know, how can you put this into practice? You know, one of the first things you can really do is have a conversation with your asset managers or internally and really asking your asset managers, you know, do they consider the impact of corporate practices on indigenous rights, economic reconciliation as part of their investment decision making, right? You can have these very frank discussions. You can ask your um, asset manager if they're including indigenous rights and respect for, uh, you know, indigenous uh, or other ESG matters 
in their regular reporting from investee companies or if they're you know looking into that and if they're participating in how they're you know maybe voting on your proxies that's another thing that you can do you know a really big part of this is knowing what you own so understanding what's in your portfolio and that's a big piece of the work that share really does for our clients is really analyzing you know the holdings that you know our you know shareholders have and understanding the impact and the intersection they have with indigenous rights and that can also be you know impacting a you know statement of investor principles that you you know the, your investment committee recognizes the responsibility to invest in a manner that does not harm the environmental or spiritual or cultural values of indigenous people we've seen that put into uh, statements of investment principles and that third piece is really that investor stewardship and putting you know investment uh dollars to work advancing indigenous rights indigenous title uh and indigenous interests um advancing them in the public marketplace and we've seen a number of really uh, successful stories with that we had an engagement with uh tmx group which is the company that actually operates the toronto stock exchange and through a really constructive dialogue with their executives and this was uh led by the atkinson foundation not only did the management really agree that they had a uh, responsibility, both due to their historic actions and as kind of a figurehead in the Canadian public market space as the operator of the stock exchange to advance Indigenous reconciliation. So in most cases, we might look for a settlement, but they actually asked that this go to a vote. So the Atkinson Foundation actually proposed a vote at the AGM to make commitments on Indigenous reporting and advancing reconciliation, which received 98% approval uh, from the shareholders of the TMX group. So they are looking at implementing programs and policies on Indigenous employment and community relations, objectives on disclosure and procurement from Indigenous-owned businesses, and engagement with Indigenous organizations. So they really focused on that economic reconciliation piece mm -hmm. in the kind of actions that they committed to. You know, we had a number of votes this year, uh, Toremont Industries, which was a supplier of heavy machinery um, that does a lot of mining and forestry and extractive work. Um, we did an engagement with them. We had a shareholder proposal. Again, this was an organization that took a very quick look at their impact on Indigenous rights and Indigenous lands and supported our resolution. And we ended up with a vote of 99% of shareholders voting in favor of our resolution with that company for them to explore the way that they intersect with and impact Indigenous rights and title. Um, two other groups, BCE, which was uh, Bell Canada, uh, you know, their new name or listed name is BCE Incorporated. Um, they uh, came to a settlement with us, as did IA Financial, which is a major insurance and investment manager out of Quebec. Uh, to we, They made a commitment to us and to the proponents to advance Indigenous reconciliation within their operations. And then Onyx, which is one of the uh, largest uh, private equity companies and investors in Canada, uh, headed by the uh, Jerry Schwartz. Um, we had a very long and constructive conversation with them. And, you know, we ended up not getting management support for the boat, but we ended up getting 49% of independent shareholders. Um, which sent a real message to management that their shareholders really cared about this issue. And following that 49% vote, you know, and this isn't usual, Jerry Schwartz came on live on the AGM call and said that he was personally committing Onyx to working with Share continually to understand the impact of their operations on Indigenous rights and title and to find ways that they can advance Indigenous reconciliation. So we, you know, we lost the battle, but, you know, I think we, we made some headway in the war on that one. And it really did send a message, you know, talking with Peter and others, you know, I'm reminded of stories back in the 90s and the early 2000s, when a independent shareholder return of 9% in favor of a proxy motion was a really big deal. And now we're seeing investors that are recognizing that the companies that they are invested in have a very real and meaningful impact on Indigenous rights, title, and interest. 
and that they can advance these issues and that they can, you know, cause change and put pressure on management to take very real action. So as we look into our 2023 proxy season, you know, we are really looking at those two pillars of indigenous rights and title and interest and economic reconciliation. And there's overlap between those two. They're not mutually exclusive uh, or fully kind of uh, separated, um, but we have taken a strategy of approaching those. So in the indigenous rights title uh, and interest kind of area, we're really looking at climate change and the just transition. We know that indigenous people will be, you know, the group most heavily and most quickly impacted uh, by climate change. This will be absolutely devastating for Indigenous peoples globally. And so, you know, not only do we have a responsibility uh, to address our, our climate crisis, this climate emergency, um, you know, if we're advancing Indigenous rights, title, and interest, we can't do it without understanding the intersection between uh, the existence and, you know, continued space of Indigenous people and climate, our impact on climate change and emissions. The second piece is the just transition. So this piece has been traditionally framed in a, a labor kind of context. You know, what are we going to do with all of the employees who are no longer working in, you know, automotive factories that produce diesel Cummins engines or are working in oil and gas production? How are we going to pivot them? to, you know, meaningful and a substantive work uh, when we transition to a low to hopefully one day no carbon economy. The kind of uh, elephant in the room, if I were, is, well, where are all the materials that are going to support this transition coming from? Where are all those critical and rare earth minerals going to be, you know, coming from? And the reality is, is that 90% of them are located in the traditional or currently occupied territories of Indigenous people, you know, uh, within Africa, within South Asia, um, specifically within the Americas, North, Central, and South America. And, you know, even with some of the deep seabed mining, uh, which will impact Indigenous fisheries in particular areas as well. So in this, we are looking at, you know, ways that, you know, mining companies and companies that are investing in mining companies will take into consideration Indigenous rights, title and interest. You know, as Indigenous people, generally, we support a just transition and a transition to a low and no carbon you know, economy. It's not a question of if, it's a question of how. And specifically, we've seen a number of companies, specifically Canadian mining companies, uh, when they operate in jurisdictions outside of Canada, uh, do not feel that they need to necessarily uphold uh, the commitments that they've made here. So we're looking at holding Canadian mining companies accountable for human rights issues uh, in the Andean region, uh, specifically in Chile, Peru, and Colombia. We've had a number of issues, and we're working with other groups such as IRMA, the Institute for responsible mining assurance to advance this as well. On the economic reconciliation piece, we are still championing uh, Indigenous employment and Indigenous procurement uh, and Indigenous opportunities uh, within the Canadian sphere. And that has a lot to do with dismantling that institutionalized racism that has historically and continues to provide barriers uh, to Indigenous economic reconciliation and advancement. And that's really our role in that space. So those are some of the examples of the engagements that we're doing in some of our plans, and we welcome you and we would invite you to participate in our activities. Uh, and I'm going to hand it back to Sarah very quickly, just to maybe summarize some of our collaboration between our investors and across our programs. Thank you so much, uh, Joseph. That was great examples, and thank you also for reminding us about the intersection of Indigenous people's rights and climate change and the environment more broadly. I find this example illustrates very well how well-crafted engagement strategies can drive changes and push other investors to incorporate new issues into their stewardship practices, including through proxy voting. Um, these issues are certainly very complex and require good understanding. Uh, and we're lucky to have you, Joseph, but also lucky to be able to partner with um, other organizations, like you mentioned Natoa um, when I was reconnecting. And, you know, one thing that makes shareholder engagement special is collaboration with stakeholders and other investors. Share by its nature 
facilitate collaboration between investors as its uh, collective program benefits each participant's portfolio and tackles systemic risk to build a sustainable, inclusive and productive economy that would benefit us all. Our collaborative model means that we have a voice with scale. We can amplify our small investors' voices using our collaborative approach and engagement strategy. And this collaboration goes well beyond that since we also work closely with other groups of uh, investors, such as the Interfaith Center for Corporate Responsibility, the ICCR, which is a coalition of institutional investors uh, which provide support and help coordinate and engagement on a broad range of issues through the lens of faith. We also collaborate with other organizations that provide us resources, information and expertise to allow us to conduct high quality engagement aligned with stakeholders' best interests. Uh, as I've mentioned, Natawa, but we also work with many of them on many issues. Um, do you want to provide some concluding remarks, Joseph? Sure. Uh, I think there's a couple of things I just want to say is that we're always uh, open and willing to present to other groups as well. So you can reach out through Sarah or Kit if you want to learn more about SHARE and our operations and our programs. Uh, we welcome you to be accomplices as we work to deconstruct institutionalized racism and create a more just and equal world through our corporate engagements. And this doesn't have to be the last presentation we do. We would be you know, happy to come back and speak more. I know we've really run the clock in this one. There was a question about whether or not we would have enough to speak about, and yet here we are with eight minutes left. But I know that Sarah, uh, Simon, and myself, uh, we don't have anything after this. Not that we're not busy, Peter. We're, we're, we do have busy jobs. Uh, but we would be willing to stick around to answer any questions anybody may have. So Sarah, with that, uh, and Kit, I just want to say chimaguach for having us, and uh, we really appreciate the opportunity to speak with the United Church and your members. Thank you. Thank you. You've given us uh, quite a bit of information uh, in the last short while. So um, we do have some time left for anybody who would like to put questions either in the chat or in the Q&A box. Um, and I just wanted to draw out uh, something that you, you talked a bit about. Um, uh, Joseph, when you're giving our, you know, those very concrete steps. So you know, the foundation itself, our assets are in pooled funds. So we don't hold, you know, X number of shares A or even one share of company A, um, but we can still participate in this work, correct? I don't know if, who, who on the share team might wanna take that, but you know. Absolutely, yeah, we worked with, uh, you know, we've worked with, you know, groups that are in pooled funds our engagement process doesn't really change that much. Uh, we simply represent a member who has funds in the pool. It does mean that we, and Sarah, please correct me if I'm wrong, we aren't able to make board proposals, but we're still able to engage with companies uh, on behalf of pooled funds, Sarah. Mm -hmm. Sarah, Excellent. do you want to, anything that you want to add to that? I confirm the, um, the, the only limitation will really would be for filing shareholder proposal where uh, you need to be in a segregated fund. But beside that, again, um, share acts as a, a network. Uh, what we do benefits all members and clients of share. So we have had in instances where pooled funds have been interested in advocating for a particular, so you know, a group that has a pooled fund invested in company X wants to advance an issue, we have systems that we look into at our other clients' portfolios, understanding that there may be another client that isn't a segregated fund that is able to put forward a shareholder proposal if it's needed. So we have a, a number of different avenues that we can take, including, you know, it's rare that we take one group in advance. It's often that we get a number of different investors together to really provide a bit of a show of force, if you will, that this is an important issue to not just one group, to, to multiple stakeholders and advance them. And I think that's Simon, you guys do that in your climate work as well. Do you want to speak to that for a second? No, just to say, absolutely. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, our, our strength is in that collective approach. Um, I think you articulated it, it well. So no, happy to, to see the time to further questions. Right. And I think, Kit, I might direct this one to you. You talked about um, shifts over time in how the pension plan is approaching this. So it's not like you had um, 
one conversation with the with the board, and then you're <laughs> you're you're there, right? Can you talk a little bit about the journey? Yeah, it's um, it's it's been a real transition, and I think that um, I, I'll speak personally about how I've seen um, the landscape, and and I'm sure that others uh, might have something thing to uh, challenge or uh, offer another part, uh, perspective. But uh, when I joined the pension plan, uh, the conversations around responsible investment were mostly focused on, um, uh, on the divestment side and the exclusion side. And over time, and I, I attribute this and uh, acknowledge with great appreciation the work that Cher has done to take us on a journey of education and support. And I think that that's, that's really supported our, uh, the, the culture within pension plan governance to shift and become complicated to think about responsible investment as, um, as, a, as a way of rethinking fiduciary duty. And, and um, whereas, you know, maybe a decade ago, people were really challenged by that idea that fiduciary duty was somehow being compromised by responsible investment. And that's just simply not the case. And so Cher has been really instrumental in helping us through that, what I would characterize as discipleship, that education and learning and the commitment to learning about the complexity of responsible investment, but also in the very pragmatic approaches in supporting us through uh, what engagement might look like and what the results of engagement are and filing proposals and, and so on. So I, I think it's been, it's been a lot of work, but I think that the, the environment around investment has really been um, um, reflective of the, the environment more broadly around our obligations to honoring the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People and the TRC calls and the TRC um, principles to reconciliation. So it hasn't, I'm not, it's not been an easy journey necessarily, and, and, but it's, uh, it's been really um, very satisfying. Thank you. Um, we have a question from, um, a participant who's wondering about connections to the Canadian Alternative Investment Corporation, whether or not Cher does does work with them. I, I don't know offhand, but I, I can I can ask for some of my colleagues who are in, in, involved in uh, some more of that network building and be okay. to follow up. Yeah. So we'll get uh, we'll we'll get back to you, Jillian. Yeah. Um, and I guess one last question that is is a slightly different piece. And so um, I'll start an answer to it and then panelists can uh, can uh, join in as they see fit. But it's um it's about actually allocating resources towards reconciliation and economic justice in that context. And the foundation itself has taken a portion of its investments and earmarked them for what we call impact investments. So those investments that are particularly supposed to have um, significant environmental, social, et cetera, impacts beyond the financial return. So there's kind of the, there's the two, there's the financial return, and then there's some social or environmental um, piece on top of that. And we had named as one of our themes for investing reconciliation and indigenous justice. And we have actually um, work with a particular fund manager who um, looks out for opportunities for us to actually make a direct investment into um, something that's gonna further um, reconciliation and ind indigenous justice efforts. Um, there are a number of foundations out there that kind of do that work themselves, the searching, the assessing if it's the correct investment for them. Um, but I can let people know that most recently in this aspect, we've made an investment um, with a firm called Raven, uh, Raven Capital. And um, they do a lot of really amazing work. I'd encourage you to, to look them up. But that is, you know, that's something that each investor has to decide for themselves if it's an appropriate investment, if they're comfortable 
you know, kind of going out and doing investing in a different way. Uh, but also happy to follow up with anybody about what that looks like. I don't know if the folks from Share or Kit, you wanna jump in on that one at all. We're not providing any investment advice, I would just say. We're just sharing our, our experiences. Yeah, go ahead, Simon. I, I think perhaps it, um, not perhaps, I think it does um, kind of uh, underscore some of the, uh, the the points that Joseph was making earlier around integration and taking that holistic approach and lens to, to, uh, to our investments and, you know, ensuring that as part of that due diligence and, and uh, process, even for um, positive, you know, impact investing, you know, increasingly we need to be understanding, you know, well, a, a, a company may be doing really good on the E, if you will, the environmental mm -hmm. side, what are those social impacts and, and are they upholding and respecting Indigenous rights and title uh, and, 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 and other human rights as well. And so really to take that integrated approach, which we are still actively figuring out, like it, it's, 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 it's hard work to be sure. Um, but, you know, obviously that's where we, we need to go. Yeah, it's an interesting space, um, and I applaud the work that you know uh, the crew at Raven are doing um, in that impact investing fund. Uh, again, this is I'm going to do that caveat: not a lawyer, not a financial advisor. This is not financial advice. Um, you know, that's a separate piece, really, from where our focus is. Our focus is really on public markets. They are really doing that direct investment. Uh, you know, really acting almost like a private equity group, right? Investing in companies directly. I think there's space for both. Um, I think it's an easy move to say, where can we put money in a group that's doing really good work? It takes a lot of work to take the money you already have invested in companies and engage in a dialogue mm -hmm. and invest in options and be willing to go to an AGM or put forward a proposal. Um, there is a struggle, uh, you know, and there is joy to be found in that struggle for sure, in finding allies and accomplices and finding uh, Indigenous communities that are impacted and being able to affect real change. I, I think it's it's two sides of a very similar coin um, or of the same coin, that approach. So, you know, for the option of, you know, where do we allocate resources? That's like, I would encourage, as, as Simon just said, both, mm -hmm. right? Um, you know, if if you can, Again, this isn't financial advice. <laughs> Absolutely. Agreed. Yeah. Well, we have come to the end of our questions and we have come to a couple of minutes past our scheduled time. So I just want to express my thank you so much to you, our, our speakers, Kit, Simon, Joseph, and Sarah. It's been a real pleasure and we've learned a lot from you today. And I want to thank everybody who's joined us and, and participated and um, asked questions. It's been a really rich uh, experience. And um, feel free to reach out to either the SHARE team or the foundation uh, with any questions you have. Um, Stephanie, can I get you to put uh, maybe SHARE's website in the chat um, as well as the foundations, which is unitedchurchfoundation.ca and then folks will have it. Um, and as you know that we did record the webinar, so um, we will find ways to make that available as soon as we can. Um, I just wanna say then, thank you all once again and blessings to you on the rest of your day. <laughs>